The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar in relation to uh, VMS storage design, in which we're going to talk about uh, RAID and uh, what level is required or recommended. My name is Richard Bell and I'm the National CCTV Product Manager here at Alarm Corp. Uh, just before we uh, get going this afternoon, a number of you are probably uh, fairly familiar with the uh, events that go on, but uh, just want to let you know that okay, everybody's in uh, listen-in mode, um, and you'll be remain in listen-in mode, they're muted for the duration of the seminar. Um, but you know, just to make sure that you can uh, see the presentation, can you uh, please click on the, uh, the hand icon that you'll see on the, on the screen? Great. But, uh, okay, you can uh, you can lower those uh, uh, now. At any time during the uh, presentation, um, you know, feel free to ask questions. You know, but just you know, remember to click on the send um, button after you uh, ask the question, so uh, it comes through uh, to me on the panel. But uh, we will be going through a uh, Q and A session, you know, at the end of uh, the presentation that for it. Okay, just a, a brief summary uh, of what some of the points we're going to look at uh, this afternoon about um, RAID levels and uh, descriptions. You know, we'll talk about the various definitions um, about how RAID is configured, you know, and there are quite a few. Um, some of them are now in museums uh, um, because of the, the technology has moved on. Um, the requirements of that, the different levels of RAID, about what they will do, offering some more so speed and then the redundancy um, for it, um, the types, um, you know, the various levels and you know, that's going to be related to uh, also interaction with hardware and software implementation, um, you know, the, the good and bad and for it and you know, the benefits and pitfalls as there is with um, various different configurations and they come down to um, uh, storage um, and cost is normally a uh, very important factor that uh, comes into this um, equation. That, uh, anyway, RAID, you know, everybody's heard the, uh, the acronym around the place but you know, where, where did it come from? It, uh, it's been around for quite a few years and that now, um, but the, the acronym was originally was for redundant array of inexpensive disks. Um, when this technology was first kicked off, I can tell you they weren't very inexpensive uh, the disks, and they weren't very large in size compared to what we have uh, in today's uh, marketplace. Um, but the, it sort of changed uh, by design and normally everybody refers to RAID now as a redundant array of independent disks and that for it. So uh, anyway, if we look at some of the, uh, the types of RAID, you know, when, uh, we just look at the numbers down the left hand side, you know, RAID is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, you know, there's 10 and 50. Um, there's a number of other various configurations of RAID as well that um, oh, I haven't left off uh, this list. You know, you know, there's RAID 7, RAID 53, RAID 60, RAID S, and there's a couple of others um, as well. But uh, you know, I'm going to concentrate on the main ones that uh, we see today um, in the VMS um, and the NVR recording um, uh, platforms that are probably most commonly used um, throughout not only this industry but in general on the IT um, side of things and that for it. And from if we take that screen and we go look at the next one, we're going to probably you know, cut that down to four. That uh, and we'll look at uh, uh, these particular ones starting at uh, the top, um, RAID 0 uh, which is commonly known as striping is another way, um, RAID 1 which is mirroring, RAID 5 um, is also striping but they has what they call a parity and RAID 6 is uh, building on RAID 5 which it has a um, dual level of parity and um, we'll look at those particular ones and for it. So, um, where do, where do we look at um, in the overall scheme of things and that for it? You know, and here's a simple diagram, you know, of uh, a triangle, you know, okay, fast or cheap or fault tolerant, you know, it depends on um, what the actual client and the, uh, is after and that for it. And within uh, an application, you may have a 
number of different RAID um, sets actually you know, combined as one solution. And we're going to discuss that there where we do combine two types of RAID um, in a VMS server that we commonly use uh, here for one of our platforms and that'll be RAID 1 and RAID 5. For it. Okay, so we kick off and look at RAID 0. Now if we think of the uh, the first letter in uh, Ray being redundant. Well, um, in this case here, redundant is, doesn't really apply in a RAID 0. Uh, RAID 0 drives that, um, or striped that they are written to at the same time, but they both have to be running um, to actually have an operational system. If you lose either one or the other disk, um, you lose both. You know there is no backup as such. Um, the big benefit of RAID zero is speed. So you can actually uh, uh, you've got two areas. It's a bit like probably asking you know um, one person to write down say the letters of the alphabet. You know if they started at A and went all the way through, then if you if you got two people, one started from uh, from A and the other started from Z and they worked their way back, you would get it done quicker. So. That's probably a fairly crude way of putting it, but uh, RAID level zero um, is for speed. It's probably not really designed as a business type application as such because you know, there isn't any redundancy. And that's the big thing which um, I want to uh, emphasize on that today. Uh, redundancy, you know, so if something fails, and things do fail, you know, disks are physical devices and are spinning at relatively high speeds, and you, know, you will get a failure at some stage. So you need to have the peace of mind that uh, you're going to have um, a working system if there is a piece of equipment that fails in your uh, in your server. So RAID 0 does have a place and it will be combined in another part which we'll talk about uh, later on, but by itself it's not probably uh, the best sort of thing. RAID 1 however, again we've got two disks and you know a RAID 1 that it requires a minimum of two disks and when it says about mirrored. So when a drive uh, has information written to it, it goes to both disks simultaneously. Now the operator um, only sees a drive letter, depending on which ones are set, whether it's C, D or E or whatever, they don't see two separate letters on the system. It is just one and that's taken care of by the, um, the disk controller and the hardware behind the system and so it just writes to it. In this case here, that if you lose either one of those disks, the system will operate exactly the same. You will not lose any data uh, for it. Um, and you know, typically in servers these days, um, and it's you know, the norm as it's become. You know, you actually have a um, hot pluggable drives. So your indication that you know you've got a failure uh, in the drive, you can actually remove that drive while it's running, and then you plug the new one in there. And the software, it knows, you know, especially on hardware controllers, that it, when it's plugged in there, it'll start to rebuild uh, the data from the file disk back over onto the other um, unit. Uh, where we use the, the drives in a RAID 1 is typically on one of our Dell servers. So uh, this is looking at a, a rear view of that particular box. And if you look on the, the right hand side, um, there are two drives there. They're um, two and a half inch drives, and they're configured in a RAID one in a mirror environment. And we typically use those for the operating system and the application. That's it's not a uh, and, and and the database. It's not an area where you're actually going to have um, lots of video um, stored. This is just basically you know, uh, to get the system running. It's got everything to just to get that part of it operational and it will then talk to the areas that will require storage for the video files as such. But typically they don't need to be overly large. Um, in these cases here they might only be anywhere from you know, 500 gig to a terabyte. Um, you know, not large by today's standards uh, but you know, that's, you know, that's not their main purpose. Their main purpose is to have a peace of mind so if one fails you can just pull it out and put it back in and then keep um, going without having to shut anything down. Now as we uh, move through you know, we need uh, video storage and as we've gone from the analog uh, side of uh, CCTV up to IP it requires a lot more especially with full HD drives for it. Now 
RAID Level 5 is probably the base default um, that people are looking at uh, these days. Um, you do need a minimum of three uh, drives. Some people refer to them as three spindles um, or the disks. It's the same terminology in that for it. And the way that it's uh, done behind the scenes, so if you lose one disk out of the three, doesn't matter which one, the system will still keep operating as such and will be uh, uh, fully functional. And for it, you can expand um, your RAID level five system. Might have four, five, six, yeah, you know, or even a dozen disks, or you know, in the um, configuration of this, and that's fine. And that for it, the way that you uh, calculate the storage uh, side of things with a RAID five scenario is that you take the total number of disks that you actually have, and then you minus one away. So in the case of um, in a server, which we'll show you a photo in, in a moment, where we use 12 drives in uh, our particular box, um, you've got uh, three terabyte drives, for example. So 12 threes gives you 36 terabytes, and you lose one because of this parity um, configuration. So you're down to 33 terabytes in a RAID 5 scenario, and that's usable data. Again. It's um, sliced and diced, it's like one big pool um, that is available and then you can carve this up into logical uh, drives uh, that are presented to the user. So they may see drives uh, E and F for example, um, they have no idea how they're configured behind the scenes, whether it is a RAID 1 or a RAID 5 um, as such. Now they just know that they just see X amount of terabytes you know, for the system. And uh, they don't need to know that, you know. You don't need to know how to draw, pull the engine out of the car. You just need to know how to put the key in and start it and drive it as such. Now this is the front view of uh, one of our Dell servers, the one we had before. The, the ones in the back just had two drives, which was a RAID 1. And now this one in the front, it can have two configurations. The top view shows 24, two and a half inch type um, drives and the bottom is uh, 12 three and a half inch drives. Three and a half inch drives are larger in capacity um, than what the two and a half inch in that are, but again it's horses for courses uh, for what they're going to do um, for it. Uh, the maximum watch we've got at the moment uh, available um, are four terabyte units. So that bottom box, you know, that can have um, 48 terabytes of what is commonly referred to as raw storage. So that's the maximum that's available. But in the case of you, know, you wouldn't just use uh, all the drives by themselves because again, what we're trying to get um, through is to have the backup and the peace of mind and having some redundancy. So if we use a RAID 5 in this scenario here, 12 by 4 is 48 terabytes, um, knock one off is 44 terabytes of RAID 5. Um, also, there's a visual indication you know, on these uh, units that they're operational, they're fine with the green LEDs. Uh, if there's something failure um, that appears, whether it's um, a power supply or a drive, front or back, you know, they are represented, it shows an amber light on the front. So then it's relatively easy for somebody to go and see what the problem that is. And again, these drives are inserted in the caddies that are spring-loaded at the front that are hot swappable. So you can actually go and uh, change those uh, drives on the fly. It doesn't require um, anything to be shut down as such. Now, from RAID 5, uh, which has been the norm for a long time here, yeah, we're now starting to set up, uh, step up to one, uh, RAID 6. Now, what RAID 6 does, um, it allows a failure of two drives in a system while it's being uh, still maintaining all its data without anything being lost at all. Now, um, while that sounds uh, very good, you, know, you also have to take into account that you actually have to allow the total number of disks minus two. So in a RAID 5, we actually took one disk into consideration for uh, the parity um, for it. In RAID 6, we have to have two. So. If I use the same scenario before as uh, um, with a um, um, four terabyte, for example, so 12 drives, 48, we're going to be losing two lots of those. So that's you know, down to 44, then 40, 40 terabytes in a RAID 6 um, side of it. 
Again, uh, this is in, in data that's uh, being fairly uh, critical and that for it. And you know, we're seeing the combination of both RAID 5 and RAID 6 uh, in the VMS uh, industry as such. Now, these disks are normally in dedicated type servers as such. They're not a, um, a this RAID 5 and RAID 6 is not really a workstation type scenario, you know, for a user interface that they're going to be using to uh, drive the client and uh, GUI. Um, they may only have a single drive still. But again, you know, a RAID 1 is, you know, strongly recommended for redundancy and that side of things. But not in the back end where we're talking uh, many terabytes of data and that for it. So uh, that's one thing to uh, to look at. Um, as progress you know, happens in the um, computer industry, you know, when I was saying about um, four terabyte drives being uh, the size that we're having, you know, the six terabyte drive has been you know, released you know, onto the market, and we're still going to be having. Um, there's the eights that are coming um, in the not too distant future, and that for it. So. You know, when you look at that, um, that's a lot of data to keep on one drive. Um, and when you configure the uh, your RAID levels, you know, if you do do the maths, is when we're looking at say RAID five, and losing one drive, or in RAID six losing two. So uh, when if you've got a twelve drive scenario, so in um, you could be losing twelve terabytes if you've got a RAID six um, situation. So. That's a lot of data to lose, you know, f um, purely for the backup. But you know, it's also there's a lot of data that you can keep you know, available and on there. Now, one of the things, you know, these drives, uh, what they have internally, you know, there's uh, how do all these sort of um, drives get connected together? Now, these days, you know, they have dedicated um, hardware controllers, you know, that. The drives uh, interface to the main computer. It's like a sub engine, you know, from the main system. You know, you you might hear things referred to as software RAID. Um, that's okay, probably in the smaller uh, end of the market. But you know, I strongly recommend that you know you have a dedicated um, controller um, at the high end. And normally, that has additional memory, referred to as cache memory, um, and it might have anywhere from you know um, five to a meg. Um, upwards of cache memory um, and that again helps the performance um, of the unit as such. But uh, you know one thing you know, you know, to look at you know is um, the throughput of these drives and the um, about how long you know and what sort of uh, time frame that you need to uh, back the, the units and that up. So you know the main things you know that I want to probably you know, to look at you know to try and emphasize these days is when uh, uh, it comes down to probably raid one and raid five are the main ones that are probably in the marketplace and that for it um, the raid six is starting to become more prevalent than that to it um, purely for you know the extra level of redundancy and that in there but as IP storage is going to grow uh, longer term, you know, it's going to be um, more and more uh, important to have these side of things. So the situation um, is that you know, you know, where possible, um, I strongly recommend to get the best level of hardware RAID controller that you can actually put in um, the system. Um, and you know, uh, over the uh, software RAID, it's not costing a great deal more these days. But the peace of mind and the throughput, because you know, when you're looking at the CCTV um, side of things, they are constantly actually having data written to them all the time. You know, now the more spindles or disks that you actually have, you know, the data gets written across all of those uh, for them. So it's not as if there's any downtime and that for it. So you know, the maximum possible that you can put in there, um, what you can afford for your budget is what I'd recommend. So um, that, uh, you know, it's a fairly um, brief, uh, it's probably overview and uh, what you can actually get and uh, we look at that. So um, if there's any uh, questions that uh, anybody's um, got, um, um, please uh, throw those uh, at me and I'll do my best to um, um, answer those and that for you. So just, I uh, would, uh, Wait uh, a couple of minutes to see if there's anything in it uh, coming through. Probably not a couple of minutes, we'll do a few seconds. 
Okay, it's one that's coming here. Uh, question has been asked. That, uh, I probably should have covered this while I was talking, but I'm glad someone's picked this up. But how long does it take to fix a failed drive? You know, in a RAID 5 system. Um, again, some of the points you know that I covered. Here, there's a number of factors of um, affecting this about how busy the system is. You know, the size of the drive and the capability of the RAID controller. Um, as I said about you now, the last point is probably one of the most important things because a lot of these hardware RAID controllers, you can actually tune them uh, to the amount of time or the amount of CPU uh, resources that you actually allocate to um, setting to rebuild it. You know, some of the manufacturers, you know, uh, have them as a default, as a, a conservative type uh, rating. You know. Um, and again, you know, while this will have little impact you know, on day-to-day -day type operations, you know, I'd really want to um, stress the point that you want to get your system back up to 100% uh, operational in as short a time as possible. So you, know, you can go in and tweak them, and so you've got to probably think, okay, what's going to be the best bang for buck in that for it? So you know, typically anything around like say 50 to 60% you know, resources that you can actually have allocated to rebuild is you now not really going to cause an issue these days. You know, considering the power that you've got in uh, the processes you know, running these servers, you know, you've got quad core, six core, and eight core servers. So if you, you know, the whole idea is get them back up and running, you know, um, in uh, the best uh, state without any failed resources as possible. Okay. 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 Somebody's asked about okay. Um, probably a bit of a loaded question. Something about you know, having spare drives uh, available. Um, yes, you can. It's uh, you can have them in either. Like say, um, typically in a RAID five or RAID six, you know, um, is the situation there where they're referred to as say a hot spare, and um, it's a drive that's like uh, allocated you know, to the system when it's been configured. Um, you don't do this after the event. You actually uh, set it up so. You might have, uh, in the case where I was looking at our Dell server with 12 drives on the front, we might have um, 11 of those configured uh, in a RAID 5, and the 12th one is set up as a dedicated hot spare. So it sits there just waiting for something to fail. And you know, somebody might think, you know, well, that's a bit of a, a waste of time. You know, uh, you know, why don't we just, if that drive's there, you know, why don't we just use it to uh, add the data on and increase the overall storage of the system? And, and that's a good point as well, but I like to think of it in another case, like you know, you might have somebody that goes and looks at all your um, your systems, you know, daily or twice a day, and they go and check to make sure that everything's okay. You haven't got any failed drives, you know, to do that. But then comes Friday afternoon, even worse if it's say it's a long weekend, and you've got a drive that's failed. If you've got a hot spare that's sitting in your system, the hot spare this takes over automatically and it just starts to rebuild the data from the one that's failed. So without any human intervention whatsoever, it just goes in there and starts copying. Now, depending on the size of drives, about how busy, etc., cetera, as we mentioned, you know, it could take two hours, it could take 12 hours, whatever period of time. The big thing is, like, if it happened on this Friday, as I mentioned, the hot spare kicks in straight away, so you turn up Monday morning and everything's all done and um, complete. You're not running the system for a couple of days with the situation of a failed drive. So, you know, as I said before, in a RAID 5, if you lost the second drive, you would lose the data, uh, the disk subsystem underneath that. So, again, it's an addition, it's like a, uh, a second backstop. So, yes, you can lose a drive in a RAID 5, hot spare kicks in, um, goes and re rebuilds that particular one. You come in on Monday, you remove the failed drive, again, the hot swappable. You put a new one and that in, and then that new one then becomes um, your uh, new hot spare in the system. So um, I hope I've covered that in a bit of a long-winded uh, fashion. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. If you require, someone's asked if you require more disk space, you know, can you increase your RAID system to include this? Um, the simple answer is yes. You know, uh, in the majority, majority of cases, that um, again uh, we've seen you know CCTV. You know, something may go in at you know 20 or 30 cameras, and then you know it's not unusual you go and stick another 10 or 20 and that on top of them. Um, the 
power of the CPUs and servers can handle some of these, but again, you may need additional uh, boxes there. But the big thing is, is storage, because you may have a requirement to have storage kept for 30 days with your, um, your video, but if you go and stick another 10 or 20 cameras on it, um, that 30 days then becomes 21 days, um, and then it's not uh, um, satisfactory to the customer. So. In a case, and I'll, again, I'll go back to um, our Dell um, hardware because uh, we use um, quite a number of, of those uh, with the 720XD server. Um, it's very flexible that you can actually strap on additional cabinets that are 2RU in size uh, with uh, another 12 um, three and a half inch slots underneath those, and you can add multiple units to that particular box. Um, and again, that has its own dedicated uh, controller, so it's not taking away from the resources of the main server. So you can actually add there, and it's um, slices and dices, so you can add another couple of drive letters. You know, if you had E and F, for example, on your main system, um, the new ones can be added as G and H, and most VMSs these days, you can just go in there and it just adds uh, to them, okay, where is the recording uh, files to be kept, and you can just add that to the, the pool. Um, and then they will then allocate those accordingly and that for it. So, you know, in the past, if you needed to uh, increase the system, it was normally the case of, you know, people had to uh, blow away the servers, um, increase the drives. Like, you know, it wasn't that uncommon, you know, only probably you know, three or four years ago where you only had one or two terabytes uh, size drives. Um, you know, if you're looking at a one terabyte drive with the uh, 12 of them in a unit yeah, allow for RAID, that's only giving you 11 terabytes, you know, which is not a lot in today's um, uh, marketplace and that for it. So yeah, you can go and expand them and it's not really uh, an issue as, as such um, because things have to be flexible for it. Okay. That's it there. Well, the questions seem to have uh, dried up, so um, I'll just uh, go through a, a couple of summary points um, that I wanted to cover, you know, about when you're looking um, at your various uh, RAID uh, requirements for your VMSs as, as such, that, uh, you know, your redundancy level. Again, I was saying about, you know, operating systems, you know, the, uh, the application and your, your database, you know, typically like a RAID 1 that you've got in there. And again, it's separate from your video storage uh, as such. So that is, you know, is really probably the main, the, the main thing as it's a given that it should happen these days. Um, speed, you know, there, that's an issue you know, as well. Um, if you can uh, add more spindles to the system, you know, if you uh, where you can do say three drives in a RAID five, and then um, you could actually get the same amount of storage of say six drives, but they say smaller. So instead of say three four terabyte drives, you know, um, you could put six two terabyte drives in there and achieve. You know, a similar amount of storage, but if you're spreading it over more spindles, it's going to add your speed um, on that for it. However, when you're working with there as well, you got to look at your disk space that you that you lose when you actually throw in your parity or your dual parity drives. So, um, you know, when you've got a four terabyte drive and you're losing one in, um, in a RAID five or two of them in a RAID six, that's uh, something to be considered. But these days, you know, that's becoming the norm, and uh, uh, if you can actually get the amount of storage in one server with that amount of uh, space, uh, the extra cost of the drives um, outweighs the cost of actually installing two servers as such. And again, your servers are becoming more um, reliable because you've got you know, dual power supplies in those, you've got RAID 1 in your, your OS, RAID 5 is in the front, so there's a lot of redundancy in that built into the hardware as such uh, for it. And one of the big things um, that I can't stress them is the rebuild time. You know, this is one of the things you know, to find out from your, your system integrator about. You know, what is the what are the parameters that are actually put into the system? So if and when a failure does occur, that you actually get that system back up online. Um, so you've got you know the peace of mind on that for it. So um, you know, with RAID six, yes, you've got your two drives out there, but you've got some additional overheads for uh, for some of those as well. Um, and then you know that may take a, uh, away for some of the you know, the throughput. But again, you actually have to look at you know, the specific uh, configuration, what you're actually doing with your VMS. But um, there's no uh, right or wrong way and to it, but uh, just you know, the application at the time. 
Okay. Would you like to know more? So um, again, you can go and visit our uh, website, alarmcorp.com.au, where you can subscribe to the Alarm Corp Pulse, Alarm Corp Pulse magazine, and get the information automatically. And you can contact any of uh, the people listed below, including myself. And I'll just leave that there for uh, a couple of uh, seconds. So if you haven't got our details and email addresses or phone numbers, you can jot them down. But, um, and it's also, uh, you can follow us on uh, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn and, uh, and Twitter uh, these days in the, in the social media circles. We're getting near the uh, the end of the year, and um, there's one uh, intrusion-based uh, uh, webinar for next uh, Thursday, the 20th. Uh, that'll be run by my colleague Jeff Rushton about can wireless access control really save me money? So uh, that's what uh, Jeff's got in store for you. And the CCTV side of things, well, that completes our um, schedule for this year. Um, I hope it's been beneficial to a number of the people who have attended uh, for it and any uh, questions you know, either now or any of the topics that have come up there, please uh, contact me uh, or shoot me um, uh, an email for it. But uh, you know, when you attend any of one of our uh, webinars, you can um, check out the promotions on the uh, uh, website, use the code uh, shown there for an additional 10% uh, off your you're already uh, discounted prices and that for it. It applies to nearly all of our product ranges with a few exceptions that are you know, listed at the below on the screen there. I'd like to thank you for your time today. Um, we look forward to seeing you at the next time that we uh, get together um, for uh, this year. I appreciate your, your attendance and um, good luck and thank you for uh, your attending. Thank you very much. Goodbye.